I don't know. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Two Pages Podcast. I'm your host, Skeletroy Blockbuster, and with me as always, we have a cavalcade of uh, great storytellers. With me, of course, is Grant Beard, Maeve LeFay, and Thomas Fireheart. How's it going, guys? It's going. Definitely going. Not drunk enough yet. <laughs> Not drunk enough? Yeah. Right. Well, that's a problem. Like I couldn't afford it. Right. Well, if it's that cheap of stuff, then I guess we got to push this back another hour. Keep drinking. <laughs> <laughs> no, well... She's reading the second story, so she's got time to pound it back while you're reading the first one. Okay. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> so, um, we had a little bit of a conversation on the Facebook page earlier, and uh, Tom and I had a, a pretty tough time writing this episode. Um, yeah. <laughs> Maeve, not so much. Um, Grant, did you write to the prompt? Or did you just write whatever? Because I gave you free reign. I was going to say, I tried to stick with it as much as I could. It's um, it's kind of in the spirit of things. So, sort of. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I got to say, February in Canada is a fucking tough month to write. Too much <laughs> snow shoveling. Oh, far too much snow shoveling. But... I was going to say, do you remember what grass looks like? No, we don't. <laughs> I generally don't go outside anyway, so no. I think it's in a video game somewhere. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. Maybe, maybe it's in that, that terribly... It ter terribly. Uh, oh God! Now I forgot the word. Mm. Yeah, maybe we could just say nostalgic because you're nostalgic to you know shoveling now at this point. That terribly nostalgic feeling you get when you look at grass and shovel night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that. That goes twofold because now you're shoveling rocks instead of snow, and then you're shoveling <laughs> snow rocks. And then you're, wait, is this isometric perspective? Damn it! <laughs> Every podcast from now on is the shovel cast. Let All right. <laughs> so, um, just one point it. of business before we get uh, underway with the stories here. Um, we're uh, going to be looking for some new people for next month. Um, we're always looking for new people to read stories, and, uh, <coughs> sorry. Uh, the prompt for next month is, uh, well, it's going to be April, so let's go, uh, two pages of fools. <laughs> I'll leave that to your discretion. If you'd like to write a story, just, you know, leave a comment below, or, uh, you know, go to the Facebook page, write a comment. Send me a private message. There's lots of ways to get a hold of me, so if you're interested in writing a story, let me know. I'd love to have you aboard. So, uh, unless you guys have any other uh, new pieces of business... Oh, there is one other new piece of business, actually. Uh, Maeve LeFay started a new podcast. Mm -hmm. Why don't you uh, talk a little bit about that? Alright, so... It's called the For the Love of Fantasy Book Club. And what we do is every month we read a book. This month was, I actually have a book right here. Love Bookshelf Backward. I have access to everything I need. Was Wild Magic. And, yeah. So, well, I'm looking for it right now. If anyone who's read the book, uh, you can go to the Facebook page for For the Love of Fantasy. And, uh, you can uh, say whether or not you would feel comfortable discussing it on camera like this. And we'll be doing a new one every month. So yeah, there's that one, but that wasn't actually the one I was thinking of. Oh, uh, Fiction no. Friday. Oh, Fiction Friday, yeah. That's right. I read a new book. You're so busy on YouTube, you don't even know what you're doing. 
No! <laughs> I'm so busy. I created a monster or something. <laughs> oh, boy. Christian Friday, I read a new story that I wrote and try to upload it every Friday. My roommate plays WoW, and I try to respect that, so I try and see if I can get it in really early. Or around midnight Thursday, sometimes I can because sometimes I lose track of time. <laughs> but I'm more or less for Friday. So yeah, if uh, if you're interested in hearing, you know, weekly stories that are kind of like this, only less comedic, more story driven, mm -hmm. you know, with actual what? purpose and not just you know dick jokes in it, check it out. <laughs> it's good stuff. Oh, I just realized I don't have any dick jokes in my story this time. Oh, it's okay. I made up for it. Don't <laughs> worry. <laughs> Troy just goes dick, 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 dick. <laughs> Dick, 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 dick. <laughs> well, I got a checklist of words that I have to cross off. Every episode, I introduce a new word. I forgot ass. You gotta put this an ass word in there somewhere. Goal fucking. Oh God. Goal fucking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, we'll get to that a little bit later. Grant, why don't you start things off? Well, after that roaring intro, why not? So I, I tried to, like I said, keep with the theme that we were going for with, uh, you know, more of the, the St. Patrick's Day kind of theme. So here we go. The old saying, green with envy. That's exactly what the headline would read if Eleanor and Connell couldn't track down a little bugger that was causing an entire town to turn into another Roanoke. The scene was grisly, or as grisly as turning people into green husks could get. Instead of catching a single person or the occasional couple enjoying a pint over dinner in a movie, this was an entire family at their dinner table. Time was running out, and Eleanor and Connell knew it. So did what they were hunting. The twins were walking the house looking for some trace of gold that may have been left that may have been missed. After all, this family wouldn't miss it. It would be the perfect bait to track down the assailants and had turned 23 homes upside down and caused the deaths of at least 19 people over two days. March 17th was tomorrow, which gave them under 36 hours to finish their investigation and finish their hunt. Green eyes flashing in a gleam of light hitting a jewelry box hidden under a bed upstairs, Connell quickly snagged the contents and ran to find his sister. Found some. Where to? They needed to pick a place and set up a stakeout. Eleanor had an idea where the little hobgoblins would be already, so having snagged the jewelry from her brother, she ran out the door. Connell not far behind. We are not going where I think we're going, cried Connell still only a few paces behind Eleanor. And why not? That rainbow has been there for three days. Pop's journal doesn't talk about where to find these damn things, so why not act on some myth? She was right. Oftentimes you had to listen to the back listen back to the myth of a listen back to a myth of a beast or entity, then pull from from it the truth you could. Besides, how many times have you seen a rainbow pop up in the same place every day for the last three days? Common sense, little brother. Two minutes. I'm two minutes younger than you. Of course, when it matters, then I'm the older, more responsible brother that has to pay the dinner bill. Tensions were running a bit high for the twins. They had been trying to hunt this threat down year after year in the same town for the past three years. Three years of founding their skills and attempting to end a band of murdering thieves. Maybe they finally had a way to kill these things. About an hour's walk later, they were close to where the rainbow was starting. And that was the odd thing. This rainbow had a clear ending and beginning. This is just crazy. I'll never see a rainbow the same way again. Damn these things. Connell could nearly touch the light coming off the beam of uh, light and seemed to die off up in the clouds. That is, if his hand didn't feel like it was going to burn in the process. Who would have thought these things loved heat as much as they do? 
It only makes sense. Why do you think the bodies turn green? After all, we do carry iron in our bodies. Eleanor always had to bring science into the mix. Sometimes it made things easier to track down and figure out. Other times it causes all kinds of wild goose chases that could have been solved easier with a sledgehammer. Once you heat iron, it turns to a green pigmented flame. Then again, it could also burn gold. She would yammer on for hours sometimes. But thankfully, a swift smack to the head from a rock in the woods gave her a start as she yelled in pain. Donald ran to her side and helped her out, 45 at the ready, to blast whatever came out of the woods. Nothing came but the chittering little giggle they had grown accustomed to snapped Eleanor back to her senses. She held her own weight and pulled her pistol out as well, wrestling from the left, then the right. Two small pointed-eared creatures jumped in the twins both sides, uh, from both sides of the woods. Turning on their respective sides, they loosed two rounds each in the head of the monsters. This stopped them flat, but they knew regular rounds wouldn't be able to drop these things. The insides of the bullets, however, were filled with sulfur. They both watched <clears throat> with bated breath, Eleanor not blinking, watching how her, creature, uh, how her creature handled started clawing at its own head, obviously affected by something inside the wound. Its nails digging into its flesh, as soon its entire body fell to black ash and agonizing scream. The other followed suit as the twins looked at each other with a smile. Two down, how many more do you figure? Connell was checking his pistol as he asked. This always, always careful with the other two's firearms. I figure another ten or so with the amount of homes they sacked, it makes sense. Sounds like the Scooby-Doo ending, then. They ran through the woods, blasting all the little buggers they could find. By the end, it were nine small piles of black ash burned down from the sulfur and the bullets. A couple scrapes, of <clears throat> a, couple scrapes a few more rocks, rock throws at them later. The twins looked over their prize, a nice melted pot of gold sitting at a clearing in the woods. After years of tracking them down and years of looking over their notes, Eleanor and Connell finally had a story to tell the other hunters across the country for whenever St. Patrick's Day came around. Of course, they added the rest of the gold to the pot, then turned the uh, value to the valve to the right, letting the liquid metal turn into hunks of gold coins. Well, that'll keep us set for a while. How many are there, Connell? Enough for a one-up in the last five visits to the diner. We're square, sis. He grabbed the bag of coins, slung it over his shoulder, and the two of them hopped back into the car that they left at the edge of town. Done. Nice. I enjoyed that story and the fact that, like, it wasn't like a hilarious laugh out loud story, but mm -hmm. it kept me smiling the whole time. <laughs> and uh, that holds just as much value to me. So it was an interesting, gripping story. Like, because for half of it, I was like, "What the fuck are those green blob things?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I have like a plot and mystery and shit. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, sometimes not having penises in your story can be a benefit. I mean, some... <laughs> <not all. laughs> yeah, you know, just uh, just occasionally. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's okay. I Like I said, I tried to fit to the same thing with the leprechauns, but I, I didn't want to make it too obvious until the end of it, so... Hmm. I think it did well. I enjoyed it. Thank you. It's pretty good for what I did in about four hours today. <laughs> All right, so one down, three to go. How's that drink coming along? <laughs> Which means we're actually alcoholic. Like I said, it's going to forget it, so it's Pepsi. <laughs> All right, we'll take a big swig and then start reading. Well, yeah. Okay. 
So if you are Irish, you might want to step up for about five minutes because my story is called Two Pages of Bad Irish Stereotypes. Oh, no. <laughs> All right, here we go. It was a very long time ago when fairies and ghosts still roamed the land where during the night you could hear the wail of the banshee over the forest. Yes, it was a simpler time when taverns ran out, out of stout, never ran out of stout. Bards ne'er ran out of song, and everyone spoke an offensive fake Irish accent, which I didn't really practice. So. Oh, sorry. that's just gonna make it even more offensive. So this is gonna. Be <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Have at it. At the old harp and shamrock, a tinker lad named Seamus was working for the summer, tending to the bar, ensuring the innkeep never, never need lift a finger. At least for the summer, he watched the old drunkard, ginger filled fiddler, stop playing once again to shout for more stout, while more men and women shouted at him to keep playing his tune. The young harper slunk away from the scene while all the focus was on his bandmates' fixation. The lad wormed his way through the rioting crowd and came to the bar telling the tinker lad that he would have a pint of stout and potatoes. Yeah, I know there are new world, world, uh, new world crop, but you can decide your own timeline and live with the the stereotypes on St. Patty's Day. Will you be taken off the road? Uh, on the road with him again? Seamus asked. Oh, fuck no. Don't think I'll be working that Eugene again. He means Patty. Seamus, said the Tinker Lamb, but washing out another glass. It'll, it'll be mighty hard a traveling van with only a harper. Bards don't gather garner much respect to the one who had. Plus, the road is a dangerous place. Yes, and I've seen you and you, your tinker folks at the fair with the ponies. You travel all year, don't you? And, if I'm not mistaken, you play the flute? Jim's eyes widened, and he shook his head wildly, thinking of his ma, sisters, cousins. He'd be roving with them all his life. And so it had been for generations. Could he simply uproot himself uh, from his clan to the life of probable stranger? There's no way in hell, Patty. I said, I thought you might say so. Just a minute, minute my computer's being. My computer's more drunk than I am at the moment. Go home, computer, you're drunk. <laughs> Should we tell Jimmy that, too? Tell his computer to go home, it's drunk? Maybe. Oh, here we are. So I invite, So I was invited along, said a sweet voice from the bar. Beside Patty stood a lass with rowanberry hair and emerald eyes. Smiled at them, flaunting her finely carved fiddle. I fiddle and I sing, and only drink when I'm not playing. Seamus hesitated. And I can lead you to the leprechaun school, she said with a wry smile. That was it. Seamus was a practical lad, and he could not leave his family and join some leeward band, nor for a sweetheart. But for gold, he would do anything for. Let's go! And thus the wayward band was formed, and they hit the road. They did not play in any big venues on the road to Tour Lure. The forest of bad stereotypes and awesome real. They crossed. They crossed over the tree line and set up in Shamrock Meadow. The lot of them lit a fire and sat around it, ready to tell the most ghostly tales when the dead in the dead of night, an impossible rainbow appeared, with and a tiny, green glad ginger bearded man. Came sliding down the bloody thing and conjured, excuse me, and conjured a cauldron 
filled with gold coins and shining bright moon, uh, uh, shining bright moonlight like fairy galaxies. Holding his eyes through wide, the coins fell through her hands. She examined it with her brother Patty, who craned his neck over, while Seamus just stared at the impish smile on the leprechaun's face as he raised his eyebrows. I've got the deal for you, laddie. Seamus jumped up, knowing the caution of a fairy deal. His mom had always warned him of the capricious day. Worst of all, the leprechaun. They be known to curse their gold. Perhaps something the lad should have considered just a wee bit before setting off with the goal of stealing such a treasure. A deal? We should take the bloody deal, Patty said. It's not like leprechauns are known for being tricky and honest band folks like us are never fucked over in these stories. Seamus bit his lip, thinking back to all his mam stories. Or really any story that he'd ever heard about a fairy deal. And remembered vividly, one man was transformed into a wee bird, another lost a bet for the treasure and was forced to to lure instant travelers into Shemrock Meadows for 50 years. And one was simply given the gold, and then after that he hung with it for, for years. He went mad and died on a mountain of stolen gold and ingots in a deep, dank cave. But this was not going to happen to Seamus. He saw no risk in it, so he took the hand of the leprechaun with a wily smile. You'll take your deal. The leprechaun simply smiled as he pulled up the shamrock from his green hat and laughed. The shamrock grew to a large size and golden strings from its surface uh, rose from its surface. The stem of the shamrock danced, uh, became a bow and what was now an, a bow, to what was now an elegant fiddle. The leprechaun played a few notes and danced a wee jig. From the cauldron that once held all the coins emerged three other leprechauns, each with a oh, each wielding an emerald instrument to match their opponent, save the one who only wore polished black shoes with a gold golden green uh, shamrock of shaped buckles. James knew these were what these were from first glance. They were enchanted river dancing shoes that could be heard from coast to glen. Oh, <laughs> <God. laughs> from coast to glen, remember that. Mm. Here be me deal, laddie, the fiddler said. If you and your band can play a more enchanting tune, ye shall be granted a fairy boon. But if me we then plays a more wondrous jig or reel, then ye shall be taken away and killed. That doesn't rhyme, Colleen adventure. <laughs> Listen, Lassie, I'm a magical fucking wee man with a treasure. Do you want me lucky charms or not, you idiot? <laughs> Colleen promptly shut her gob and listened to the bargain. Yes, the leprechaun. I challenge Seamus and the band to a rock off. And no, Tanisha C., the writer of The Devil Went Down to Georgia and all those other tunes cannot sue me. This is a long standing dual scenario in fiction and folk tale, so you can just deal with it. I support any story <laughs> that has a rock off, I'm just going to say right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the leprechauns played. The fiddle went back as he danced his jig, as the river dancer danced his jig, vibrating the very earth that they stood upon. Fireworks flew from the fiddle and the harbor's um, string, and voices from the wind blew through the trees of the forest. The 
<laughs> Maybe I am drunk. Maybe. <laughs> <clears throat> well, it does take a little while to sink in, so, you know, maybe it's starting. <laughs> <laughs> You're drunk on Pepsi, yes. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> I don't know if sugar does that. Oh, okay. So the leprechaun started playing. And, uh, oh, wait. There we are. Fireworks fell off from their instruments. And the river dancer kept dancing and dancing until a wee flame sprouted from the bottoms of his shoes. And the river dancer was engulfed in flames, yet he still danced to make sure those leprechauns would win their game. That's commitment. <laughs> that is commitment. <laughs> so he danced and he danced while the fiddler played. He danced and he danced. Until it was day. Those are the only fucking rhymes that you're going to get out of me. It was really hard. <laughs> <laughs> and a rainbow appeared from the light of the flames. And the river dancing leprechaun danced up into the heavens. Well, the leprechaun still played there too. And the band finally ceased. Um, so, needless to say, Seamus's band, unfortunately, did not have a river dancer who could make fireworks and go up to the heavens on a rainbow. So they kind of fucking lost. And just as the deal went down, they were taken away to the fairyland and they were healed. <laughs> and then the leprechaun flapped over a pint of Guinness. The end. So, uh, I gotta say, favorite character in that was definitely the, the river dancing leprechaun that caught on fire. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the only one. But I gotta be honest, I went to YouTube and I started playing Devil Went Down to Georgia. <laughs> uh, I didn't do that, but the tune of it ca came into my head. <laughs> oh, I totally did it. Guitar Hero version, I might add. Nice. <laughs> you just win. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. I went there. <laughs> Went to Georgia? <laughs> well, I am the devil. <laughs> I always had my suspicions, but I was never really <laughs> sure. Yeah, I leave my horns <laughs> over there a lot, so sorry. <laughs> Confirmed. All righty. Well... Uh, what do you got, Tom? <laughs> Something I wrote yesterday. <laughs> Hang okay. on, I, I pretty to... much wrote mine today, so whatever. I, <laughs> I, I want to point out that maybe, maybe, Tom should have read Maeve's story because Tom's got a closer Irish accent. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't Australian accents close? I think they're closer to British accents. Well, it's still closer than an American accent. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was the other thing before that awesome character came in. Um, I thought it was great that your uh, Irish accents were so bad that they eventually just went away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love to so oh. much Irish music, and then it just didn't go away. It, it's bad. I actually sing with an Irish accent. I sing terribly, though. But I sing with an Irish accent because I listen to mostly Irish movie stuff. And, uh, but I can't, I can't fake one while I'm talking. So. Mm. All right, so, um, yeah, sorry to cut you off there, Tom. I just had to get that out. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Uh, okay. Luckily, this is a podcast for people who aren't easily offended, so... <laughs> 
the title that I came up with out of nowhere I'm sticking with, even though it'll probably offend people in this podcast, but oh well. I wrote it down, I'm not changing it. A leprechaun at school, or the day something interesting actually happened at school that didn't involve guns. <laughs> uh, okay. It was a gloomy day in Townsville, a small city in Australia. It had been raining all morning, and the teens at Mercy College, a high school, just to clarify, were bored shitless. During the first class of the day, however, the rain stopped suddenly, and as the class was 80 minutes long, the sun had plenty of time to dry up most of the rain. When the teens came out for lunch, they noticed that a rainbow had come out and actually ended on the school oval. A small group of teens who noticed this ran over to it as quickly as they could to get a closer look. As they started to get closer, something started to appear at the end of the rainbow. It was a pot of gold, and here they all thought their parents had made that shit up. Or actually, it might have been a cauldron of gold. I mean, the thing was fairly big. Anyway, where was I? Ah, yes. Ah, uh, semantics. Holy... <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit, said Henry, the oldest of the lot. Is this legit? Seems that way, said Davida, the group's token girl. What the fuck are we waiting for then, shouted Ryan. Let's take it before anyone else grabs any. Unfortunately, other people had noticed. But before a fight broke out over the gold, something jumped out of the pot, or cauldron, of gold in a bright light that actually blinded a few of the teens present. <laughs> fucking teenagers. The thing that jumped out at it turned, to be, turned out to be a midget in a weird costume. Or at least that's what the teens thought at first. In actual fact, it was a genuine leprechaun. Before anyone, el- but before anyone could say anything, the leprechaun began to speak. Hello, my dear gents and ladies. I'm a leprechaun, Lachlan McShady's. If it's gold that you're after, that gives me some laughter, but call me short and I'll damn you to Hades. Huh, what do you know? The little fucker can talk, said a random teen whom then disappeared in a puff of smoke after Lachlan clicked his fingers. Hey, said Nick, the last of the teens in the small group. Where the fuck did he go? I'm going to be very blunt and tell you what I did with the runt. I've sent him to hell, and it's just as well, the beleaguering dumb little cunt. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, said Henry. Wait, who was that guy he just killed? I don't know, said DeVita. Probably no one we knew. Oh, okay. Wait a minute, where did... <laughs> Wait a minute, where did everyone else fuck off to? They all ran off after that guy disappeared, said Ryan. Didn't you notice that? No, said Henry. Guess I wasn't concentrating on that. Nick and Ryan were both confused. They ran away screaming. How the fuck did you... How the fuck could you two miss that? Oh, so that's what that noise was, DeVita said in realisation. Ryan didn't verbally answer, he just shrugged his shoulders. Well, I guess with them gone, we're the only ones left to claim this guy's gold then, Henry said. How the fuck do we do that? questioned Ryan. He's got magic and shit, we can't just take it or end up like that other guy. If me gold you be wanting to claim, I propose that we play a fun game. Some riddles I'll ask if you're up to the task. If you lose, you'll all be, ma- you'll all be mine to maim. Uh, what was that last part? asked Nick. Lachlan said nothing. After thinking it over, the greedy teenagers agreed that the gold was worth the possible risk of death. Teenagers, am I right? Unfortunately, these kids had never been informed that gold is essentially worthless these days compared to certain other things they could discover. Or at least it was last time I checked. They would have been better off finding oil or something. Though I guess it is better they didn't. If they did, the U.S. might have invaded or something for no reason. Okay, Lachlan, said Henry confidently. We'll play your game. If we win, we get your gold. If we lose, we lose. The four of them collectively gulped as Lachlan cleared his throat. <laughs> Just realized I didn't clarify, by the way. It's a case of they have to get all the riddles right to win. If they get one wrong, they lose. Okay. Um... And if you want to actually guess what you think the 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 riddle is, then you can. But like, don't 
actually vocalize it until after, and not just like, you know, just for fun. Challenge okay. accepted. <laughs> it shouldn't be too hard because, like, I purposely made it something that people should be able to get. But yeah, because I, I had to make it up, but also make it fit a limerick. Uh-huh. To see me is something quite rare. Old Christians view me with despair. I'm an interesting sight. You'll only see at night. What am I? Guess if you dare. Shit, I knew I should have paid attention during RE, Nick said under his breath. Davida decided to clarify something. How many guesses do we get? One each, replied Lachlan. Shocking them all. Hey, shouted Ryan. I thought you only spoke in limericks. Well, sort of, replied Lachlan. I do for the most part, but there are only so many fucking times you can make up limericks in a row before it gets boring or you just run out of shit that rhymes. The Rex aren't easy, you know. Now get guessing. The teens thought hard about what to answer with. A few After a few minutes, they finally answered. A vampire? said Nick. No, said Lachlan. Next. Way to waste a fucking answer, Nick, said Ryan. Mm-hmm. Well, if, you're so, if your answer is so fucking great, you go next. All right, I will. The biblical apocalypse, said Ryan confidently. Nice try, but no, said Lachlan. What? cried Ryan. Ha! teased Nick. Stiff shit, fuckwit. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, you two, said Henry. Okay, my answer is... A naked woman. The other teens death stared Henry. Your answer is both fucking stupid and wrong, said Lachlan. Jesus Christ, said Ryan. And I thought Nick's was a waste of an answer. What the fuck was that shit? Henry said nothing. His reason was the whole old Christian's line and the fact that he was somehow completely unaware of the existence of porn. He also forgot that women get undressed during the day as well. He's a fucking idiot is what I'm saying. (laughs) Now only Davida was left to guess. If she failed, they lost and possibly had to spend the rest of their lives being tortured by this leprechaun. If they win, they get the gold. Which, if they're smart, they'll melt down and sell on eBay for an inflated price. Davida gulped and then gave her answer. A blood moon? She said. Lachlan considered this for a second before answering. Your answer was close, but no. I wanted the official name of what I meant. Therefore, you are wrong. The correct answer is a lunar eclipse. <laughs> oh, come the fuck on, dude, said Nick. That is some pedantic bullshit right there. <laughs> Don't like it? Too ba- too fucking bad, you little shits, said Lachlan. Who are you calling little, Ryan said accusingly. You, Ryan, don't, cried Davida. Fucking little sack of rabbit shit. Visibly enraged, Lachlan pulled, his sleeve, pulled up his sleeves and stretched his hands, also cracking his knuckles. Right, that does it. You're all going to burn in hell, you useless teenage fuckers. The teens flinched, but when they opened their eyes, nothing had happened. This surprised both them and Lachlan. Lachlan continued to attempt to magic them away, but it became apparent whatever powers he had were running on empty at the moment. Realising this, the kids got sadistic smiles on their faces and walked towards Lachlan, finally encircling him. Lachlan made a poor attempt to calm them down. You know, I take it back. You guys aren't useless. A little stupid, but not useless. Davida suddenly kicked him hard in the face, breaking Lachlan's nose and causing blood to gush out of it. Jesus Christ, you fucking psycho bitch! Lachlan screamed. Hold him down, Davida ordered in an eerily calm voice. Ryan quickly pinned down one of Lachlan's arms, whilst Nick pinned down the other, and Henry held both of it, down both of his legs. Davida then proceeded to beat Lachlan to death which Henry and Nick found sort of disturbing, but Ryan completely reveled in. After the deed was done, they hid the body and took the gold. Everyone else had gone to class at this point, as lunch was over by now. The four used the excuse that someone had run onto the school oval and tried to kill them, showing the blood still on them as proof. The lie working, they were, all, they were allowed to go home early due to, due to the trauma they'd apparently had inflicted on them. Before leaving, they all went back and grabbed Lachlan's body, took it to a safe place, and burned it to leave no trace of any remains. What happened to the gold, you ask? 
Well, they didn't melt it down, but they did sell it and made quite a lot of money each out of the deal, and they lived happily ever after. Well, DeVita and Ryan, who had now become a couple, did anyway, as they killed Nick and Henry for their share of the money. The end. That was a very happy ending. <laughs> yeah, I dug that. Um, <laughs> I really like your writing style, Tom. Um, <laughs> like, it, you definitely have a consistency to everything that you do. Like, I totally got the vibe that these characters are living in the same world as Keith and Gary. Because <laughs> they live in a yeah. fucked up place. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I uh, could totally buy that, you know, it would, might be the same town or, or whatever, and there's leprechauns and, you know, random <laughs> ball fights and shit. And... <laughs> I got it. I dug it. I like that a lot. Uh. <coughs> that works for me. Mm. And uh, as I said in the Facebook chat, but just to clarify for people watching, I guess, um, the idea of the just generally the, a school being a setting and just generally the whole idea in general came about from, I remember in high school... It had him having sort of, even if it was just lightly raining that morning, and then at some point, either still in the morning or at lunch, a rainbow came out, and it actually did end on the school oval, and it was actually pretty cool. I don't, I didn't run over to it or anything, but yeah, that sort of stuck with me. <laughs> Maybe you should have. Maybe there actually was a cold from filled with gold. <laughs> and well, a you, you could fight. Answer three riddles, <laughs> and probably do a rock off, and then you know, shoot up a three <laughs> All righty. So, um, didn't have time to do a choose your own adventure this month. Well, you instantly lose. Yeah, it happens. <laughs> <laughs> Although I instantly win because none of you guys had dick jokes. Mm. <laughs> what month? I forgot to mention dicks. That's your downfall. <laughs> dick, 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 dick. Okay. <laughs> Alrighty. <clears throat> High above the Earth's surface, a distress call was made to Commander Buzzsaw on Deep Space 69. 6911, what's your emergency? Buzz asked. The reply he got, however, was distorted and muffled. We need your help! Explosionville's in danger! Please hurry! Shit was going down in the explosion proof city of Explosionville. <laughs> Commander Saw really didn't want to go, as there was a chance he may run into his grandson who was still in a bad mood over that whole losing the coffee mug in the abyss of space and then faking your own death to get out of a conversation thing. <laughs> Buzz decided it would be a better idea to send an away team, which was just hell for the writer, who is good at continuing stories, but really isn't good at creating characters, and is even worse at naming them. <laughs> The away team was led by Lieutenant Spider-Man, who was still visibly upset about that whore that he went on a, on a date with last episode. His current mental instability would prove invaluable for reasons unknown at the time of writing this sentence. Um, I actually don't think that that came into play at all. I probably should have deleted that sentence. Oh well. <laughs> Also on the team was Officer Schmofficer, a normal-looking human in a nice red shirt. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, but this isn't Star Trek. He's going to be fine. I mean, I already mentioned how terrible I am at making characters, so I'm not going to kill this guy off. I just mentioned the shirt because it looked nice. 
<laughs> so, rounding out the away team was the recon robot, R2-D Bag. Nowhere else in the galaxy will you find a droid that emits a more vile and offensive series of beeps and tones. Like, <laughs> imagine if that old school dial up internet sound was like twice as offensive and talked about fucking your wife while you're at work to pay for night classes at the International Correspondence School of Evil. <laughs> yeah, our 2 d bag's a dick, but Commander Saw keeps him around because he finds it funny when he's drinking. But that's a story for another day. The trio arrived at the teleport bay and were briefed on their mission. As they were waiting to be teleported to Explosionville, they made some small talk. Have a good time at the tournament tonight? Officer Schmofficer asked. No, it was an awful date, Spider-Man responded. Beep boop R2 asked. Skull fucking, Spider-Man said, surprised. <laughs> no, why do you ask? See, I told you guys I was going to introduce skull fucking in this episode. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I don't let you down on my promises. <clears throat> Never... R2 responded with a series of slow beeps. Fuck off, Spider-Man yelled. They're eyelids, not vision pussies. And they're not wet and ready for hot dicks. Lieutenant Spider-Man turned away and wiped the tears from his face. But it was already too late. Word spreads fast on a space station, so almost everyone already knew that he had his heart broken by a porn star. And those who didn't hear about it would read about it in the news the next day. Yeah, it's that fucking boring on a space station that news consists of how celebrity date went. <laughs> so the away team beamed to Explosionville, and immediately noticed a giant rainbow in the sky that touched down in the middle of the city. How strange, noted Officer Smofficer. How does a rainbow form at night when there's no daylight? As the trio got closer to the center of the city, they could see a large crowd gathered where the rainbow had touched down, which also didn't make sense as rainbows are optical illusions. Several people in the crowd had binoculars, camcorders, and camera phones out. The Spider-Man approached one of the barriers that the police had set up. Excuse me, officer, Spider-Man said. We're from Deep Space 69 and received a distress, call. a distress call. What seems to be the problem? Well, we think there's a leprechaun stuck up in this tree, the policeman said as he pointed to a large pine tree. Problem is, it disappears when we shine the lights up at it. My theory is, it's casting a shadow from the one limb to the other limb. The away team rolled their eyes collectively. Bleep, bleep, bloop. R2-D bag retorted insultingly. Why, yes, the policeman replied. We do have the highest rate of cousin marriage in the world here. As he pointed to a <laughs> sign like McDonald's used to have in the 80s and 90s that declared how many millions of burgers they sold, only in this case it was how many cousins got married, and believe me, you don't want to know how big that number is. <laughs> After the away team executed an unrehearsed, synchronized facepalm, Officer Schmofficer continued the interrogation. Is there anyone on the scene that has any factual knowledge of what's going on? The policeman pointed to a man in overalls standing a few yards away. It was then that the trio noticed how much the policeman just liked pointing at things instead of engaging in actual conversation. Beep, beep, R2-D bag said. Hey, yelled the policeman. I do not have a big, veiny, jizz-filled dick for a brain. Now it's almost time for me to go on break, and my cousin wife is bringing me coffee. Now get out of here. 
<laughs> As the away team walked toward the aforementioned man in overalls, they could hear the speculations of the obviously inbred crowd. It could be Crackhead who got a hold to the wrong stuff. And they told him, get up in a tree and play a leprechaun. <laughs> Excuse me, sir, Lieutenant Spider-Man said. We're here to help with what's going on, and we're told you might know something. The man in overalls turned around. Oh, hi. I'm Chucky Larms, leprechaun expert. <laughs> leprechaun expert? Spider-Man asked, confused. That's right. Chucky continued. These overalls ward off spells right here. And this is a special leprechaun flute passed down from my great-great-grandfather who was Irish. Really? asked Officer Schmofficer. Because it, it looks like a piece of metal used for connecting pieces of scaffolding. Can you play us a tune? Chucky said that he'd never learned to play the flute. He just brought it with him. Officer Schmofficer, being an accomplished concert flautist before joining the military, asked for Chucky's flute, and the group went closer to the tree. He raised the flute to his lips and played a beautiful melody. <clears throat> do, 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 do. <sighs> Suddenly, a tornado appeared out of fucking nowhere and carried half the crowd to World 8, where they'd <laughs> most likely meet their doom, crushed under the wheels of Bowser's tank treads. No, I didn't see that coming. I mean, <laughs> these are less than average people. I mean, don't forget about that whole inbreeding thing. If any of them do survive the tanks, there's no way they'll get through the boats or the airships. Mm -mm. Officer had played enough Super Mario 3 in his day to realize how many people he had inadvertently sacrificed to the Dark Lord of the Koopa Clan and handed the flute back to Chucky. I ran out of room on the page, so uh, the away team went back to the space station shot the tree with a fucking laser from space, and the rainbow dissipated, along with everything else in a three-block radius. Was it really a leprechaun? The world may never know. The end. Uh. <laughs> uh. That actually happened. So, um, one thing when I was writing the story, like, it's kind of weird, like, being so smart and writing stories that are so stupid. <laughs> like, when I'm writing dick jokes and then I use a word, like, inadvertently, it, <laughs> I'm just like, what am I doing here? <laughs> You're never too smart for dick jokes. Well, it's kind of like that's that's kind of like uh, what Kyle Justin, the the guy that does the Angry Video Game Nerds intro, has said. He's like, I could be off doing actual albums, but here here I am saying he's going to play the games that suck ass, and take you back to the past. I'm like, really? You're you're going to say that when that's easily the most renowned song that you now have? Which is kind of terrible, but... <laughs> uh, well, you make a statement whatever way you can. Bingo. <laughs> uh, that was good, though, Troy. I, uh, that, that definitely yeah. was, was fun. And as soon as you had said... You, you know, it just all kind of led up with the overalls, and then you said he's got a flute, and I'm like... He's totally going to go get whisked off to World 8. I know it's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, the uh, the overalls guy is from the the Alabama Leprechaun video. Yeah. <laughs> so, it, was, it was just uh, so easy to make that connection. A little bit. And, of course, everyone on there sounded like rednecks, and there's a tornado going through. <laughs> <laughs> 
I never even thought of that, but that's great. <laughs> We're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> no, you're in World 8. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, for one, embrace our Kumba overlords. <laughs> uh, well, folks, I uh, think that's going to do it for another episode of the Two Pages podcast. And uh, like I was saying at the top of the show, um, we're going to be looking for more people. Um, I always like to get new blood in. You know, it's it's great to have new people in because then you get a new perspective. Um, you get oh. a different style. You get something different comes to the table. So if you're, you know, even if you're afraid, we'll help you. You know, we're, as much as we write offensive, stupid dick jokes and stuff, we're a, a, a pretty good group of people, I think. No, we're not. No, we're totally not. We're going to get you in here and then just throw you to the wolves. Mm -hmm. That's why Damon didn't come back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, he's, no, he's currently being chomped on. Damon. Hope your internet situation gets better soon. Yeah, then I don't have to do stories anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Grant just likes being a co-host. So, um... Come on in so you can fill his spot. <laughs> Not in a dirty dick joke kind of way. Are you sure? I'm never sure of anything, Grant. You should know that by now. I definitely know that by now. Just like you're not <laughs> sure how many licks it's going to take to get to the center of the dick. I think the owl knows. It's kind of where I was oh, going. I hope the owl doesn't know, because with the Tootsie Pop, it was only three, because he took a massive bite. Oh, oh, no. No. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.